to speak loudly, clearly, and slowly. Okay, I'm testing. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Uh, hi, my name is Shreyas. I am going to introduce our presentation for today. So, uh, as a class, uh, we studied the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, otherwise known as the Iran deal. And the perspective that we had was to imagine as if we were presenting policy recommendations for an incoming US administration this fall. Uh, so for the purpose of our analysis, we split this big chunk of topic into four smaller pieces uh, studied by separate groups. Group one studied the framing and the context of the JCPOA uh, with regards to the history of Iran's nuclear program and the IAEA sanctions regime and so on. Group two studied possible failure modes for the JCPOA and what are known as breakout scenarios. Group three studied uh, monitoring and verification methods that were aimed to control these uh, breakout scenarios. And group four studied uh, soft and hard power options to, uh, to address this deal, uh, by which we mean um, cultural, economic, and potentially military uh, stances. So with, oh, uh, I would ask that uh, for the sake of continuity, you uh, hold your questions to the end where you will be taking questions. Uh, but with that, I will hand off to our speaker. Hi, my name is, uh, can anyone hear me? Hi, my name is Ian, and I'll be presenting for group one. Uh, we did the, we uh, analyzed the framing in the context of the JCPOA. Essentially, what that means is we looked at how we got to the JCPOA, what the JCPOA entails, and what, what the interests and motivations of the relevant states to the JCPOA are. So, Iran has had an active nuclear program since the 1950s. Um, Iran is also a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, in which they agreed to not pursue nuclear weapons. Um, however, Iran was found to have violated IAEA safeguards, um, so the place to uh, prevent that uh, in 2002, which has led to this current uh, crisis. Um, following investigations, uh, the IAEA reported to the United Nations Security Council in 2002, uh, their results um, uh, under President Obama's then audit, the law took an increasingly confrontational stance, and uh, this led to to higher tensions and series of United uh, Security Council sanctions. Um, as far as the negotiations go, uh, the E3, which is uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, and France. They uh, began the first negotiations in 2003, which led to the Tehran Agreement in 2003 and the Paris Agreement in 2004. Um, later on, they were joined by the remaining company uh, members of the Security Council. Um, negotiations uh, made progress after uh, President Rouhani uh, came into office in 2013. And uh, that led to the JCPOA, which was officially adopted on October 18th. Uh, of last year. Restrictions. Um, Iran is limited to 300 kilograms of uranium at a maximum of 3.677 enrichment. Uh, this is down from as high as 20% enrichment and over 10,000 kilograms of uh, low enriched uranium. Um, they've also been limited to 5,060 IR1 centrifuges, their oldest generation of centrifuges um, at the ponds. And they also have six cascades at their Florida facility. Um, however, only two of those will be spinning, and uh, they'll be for non uranium research on uh, Camaro Medical. Um, this is down from over 19,000 centrifuges in Iran. Uh, group two will be going more into detail on what the restrictions entail and uh, vulnerabilities of them. Um, 
Additionally, uh, Iran has agreed to implement an initial protocol, uh, which grants the IEA uh, proper access to information and facilities. Uh, however, it's important to note that they agreed to that in the 2003 Jamal Agreement and then later reneged on that. Um, all other centrifuges, besides the ones at the Fort and the Tons facility, uh, will be removed and stored under IAEA monitoring. Um, and the IAEA will be granted round the clock access to those two facilities. Um, all uh, different facilities, um, and there will be an increase of IEA's inspectors from 50 to 150. Uh, inspectors additionally can request uh, access to non imprint sites, and uh, should Iran uh, not comply with the request, it could lead to an automatic snapback of the branches. Uh, the the bitter article additionally uh, restricts on research. Iran will develop a re uh, heavy water reactor at a rock. Um, however, all excess heavy water will be uh, shipped out. Uh, currently, Iran's in negotiations with Russia to sell um, the heavy water to Russia. Uh, again, it will be limited to 3.67% enrichment, and it will not produce weapons with plutonium. And this will be the final design will be certified by the International Partnership uh, to ensure that that is the case. They will also ship out all spent fuel from heavy research reactors. Additionally, uh, research and development will be heavily restricted for the first eight years, and then slowly the restrictions will be lifted as part of a gradual evolution towards peaceful nuclear research. The timeline of the JPO, right? Uh, so on January 16th of this year, uh, it was implementation day. This means that the IEA. Uh, Certify that uh, Iran met their initial commitments and this allowed for the lifting of sanctions as if those sanctions have already been lifted or are in the process of being lifted now. Um, and year 10, which is 2025, that is termination day, uh, they will be allowed to expand their nuclear research and development uh, significantly and will be the end of the Security Council considerations of the nuclear program. In year 15, 2030, that will be the end of the majority of the restrictions. Uh, and then in year uh, 20, the IEA will end their monitoring of their centrifuge production. And in year 25, the IEA will end their monitoring of their uranium production. So the major enforcement tool of the JCPOA is the snapback. This is where if Iran is found to be in violation of the JCPOA, all the sanctions will be uh, instated in full force. Um, the IEA will be actively monitoring Iran throughout the duration of the JCPOA, and they will report any findings and not compliance to the Security Council. Uh, any member of the P5, the permanent members of the Security Council, can actually cause the snapback to be unilaterally. unilaterally. Uh, this is because the way the JCPOA is set up, uh, any party state, including Germany, who is not part of the US Security Council, uh, can bring allegations to the Security Council of non compliance. And after an appeals process and the bond deal presented their case, uh, the Security Council have to vote on a resolution to continue the suspension of the, of the sanctions. So if any member of the current five, uh, they can veto said resolution and immediately cause that back. There, however, there is a grandfather clause. This means that companies that are already signed agreed to contracts will be able to continue with their contracts in Iran. Um, additionally, uh, Iran has stated that they, would, they wouldn't uh, comply with the JCPOA if snapback were to occur. So that is something that should be considered if we ever approach that. The United States has had economic sanctions on Iran since the 1979 revolution. And Additionally, they have been the primary method uh, for piloting Iran on their nuclear program. We have had those along with the Security Council and the European Union. Uh, there was a round of uh, additional round of sanctions imposed in 2011 and 2012, and that played a large part in bringing in Iran to the table for these current negotiations. Uh, sanctions were placed on finance, uh, automobile industry, construction, and the oil industry. Uh, the United States will still maintain sanctions on their human rights abuses, uh, missile program, and their support for terrorism. Uh, the sanction, the latest round of sanctions in 2011-2012 had a significant impact on the economy. Uh, their currency fell 50% by 2013. Um, their growth rate fell 
output that they can keep run rate down 13 percent uh, in two years, and their net trade fell, their trade fell 25 percent in the same two years. Additionally, their oil industry, which was part of state uh, exports, have and the production of the oil decreased significantly. As you can see here in 2010, this is when the sanctions were put in place. And as you can see, there was a huge uh, decline in GDP. Uh, and same here, you can see in 2010, on both of these, how uh, significantly their trade fell relative to the rest of the world. Um, and then this is a uh, projection by the United States Energy Information Administration. Uh, you can see a forecast of their uh, oil production after the implementation, which was this January of 20, uh, this year. And you can also see uh, the effect that the state just had on the production. The economic effects of the JCPOA. Um, so that additionally, there are 50 to 100 billion, the number is debated, uh, held uh, that have been frozen by the United States. Um, and that money has already been released to Iran in fact. Uh, and that is expected to give about $15 million boost to their economy already. A number of deals have been signed uh, within two weeks of implementation day of that, uh, bringing large European companies to Iran. Uh, the oil industry is expected to return to their pre uh, sanction levels. And uh, the funds gained from the lifting of sanctions is expected to go towards infrastructure repair and uh, paying back debts. So now we'll look at the uh, various countries involved with the deal and what their interests are and their motivations. Uh, the United, the United States, of course, we have always had a uh, stance of non liberation and uh, we continue to support that. Uh, and there's a concern. We have a number of regional allies in the Middle East who are not friendly with Iran. And there's a concern uh, to, towards their security if Iran were to get nuclear weapons. Uh, there's also the concern of a uh, arms race in the region leading to more states having nuclear weapons. And that is something we desperately want to avoid. As we see on this uh, graph diagram, uh, in the top uh, with the solid lines, you can see what has already happened, how other states have antagonized. And red, that is the states that have antagonized other states into uh, getting nuclear weapons. And blue is states helping other states get nuclear weapons. And then in the bottom section, that is what has yet to happen. And as you can see, Iran uh, gaining nuclear weapons could very well antagonize a number of states in the region to, gain, to pursue any nuclear weapons. Iran's interests in the deal are mainly due to the economic sanction relief. Um, it will be a huge, significant boost to their economy. Um, they also may use uh, the economic gains from it to help fund. Uh, Shia groups and regimes in the region to increase their influence out of the region, also to uh, counter ISIS and to counter any Saudi efforts in the region uh, to increase their influence. Um, they may also begin to build uh, military and economic relations with Russia. Um, uh, already, uh, Russia is selling uh, S 300 missiles to them. They uh, actually saw them selling to them before uh, the deal. But they canceled uh, their uh, contract in 2010, and that was also played a part in bringing uh, Iran to the table. Um, there's also uh, the uh, China is doing their new uh, Silk Road economic belt, and Iran is going to play a large part in that uh, due to their location in their vast oil reserves. And that is also a point of concern as it's possible that the United States and allies won't be able to effectively sanction Iran as their relations with Asia grow. Um, that being said, they still continue to indicate a desire for a nuclear level enrichment program uh, and after the duration of the JCPOA. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a rival to Iran in the region. Um, and while they have declared public support for the JCPOA, they still remain uh, skeptical of the deal. They, one part of their uh, fear of the deal is they fear that this is part of a larger the U.S. is leading the region uh, as part of the U.S.'s pivot to Asia. They fear that the U.S. will be turning their focus away from the region and they will lose some of the strong support that they have come to rely on. 
Uh, it will also bring more competition to uh, the oil markets. Uh, Iran has the fourth largest reserves in the world. Um, and also, Iran's economic growth from being able to uh, fully integrate with the global economy uh, will allow a bigger. Iran will use, like I said earlier, uh, Iran will use their close funds to expand their influence in the region uh, and to capture any Saudi uh, efforts in the region, uh, perhaps like we see in Yemen. Uh, they have also previously threatened to match any Iranian developments in nuclear weapons and their nuclear program. Uh, whether or not they actually can is, un is uncertain. Uh, the current leading theory is that they would buy the technology from their close ally, Pakistan. Uh, Israel, of course, does not want to see a nuclear Iran. They are, uh, yeah, they uh, do not have good relations with Iran in the slightest. Uh, and there is widespread support uh, amongst Iranian leadership for the complete and total destruction of Israel. Um, also, along with that, uh, there is a belief that Israel has nuclear weapons. Uh, that is not, you know, it is not certain whether or not they do. And frankly, that doesn't really matter in this context because the perceived threat of the nuclear weapons is enough to give them. A uh, huge power influence out throughout the region, and a nuclear Iran would take that away. Uh, so even if they don't have nuclear weapons, it'd be very likely that they would pursue it uh, if nuclear Iran were to gain nuclear weapons. Uh, there's also worries that sanction relief will need more funding for uh, anti-Israeli organizations. Already, they have made uh, claims that those S-300 missiles that uh, Russia sold to have been signed to Iran after the signing of the JCPOA. Uh, will are already in fact going to the border. Um, they also believe that the JCPOA is only a stopgap um, and that it only delays the potential of the nuclear Iran uh, by 10 to 15 years at the most. And that uh, after the end of the JCPOA, they will return to their very short breakout break time. Uh, Europe uh, has played a large part in negotiating with Iran ever since uh, 2003. Um, there is a wide support among the general public and uh, leadership for, for the JCPOA and continued negotiations with Iran. Um, in part, this is because they, uh, will benefit, they are benefiting immensely from Iran being allowed to reintegrate into global markets. Uh, within two weeks of the signing of the JCPOA, uh, President Hussani was uh, visiting various states and signing major deals uh, with companies to bring their business to Iran. Uh, and then finally, uh, Turkey, Egypt, and Jordan, they are the three other major uh, economic and military powers in the region. Uh, currently, they lack the infrastructure, funds, or willingness for a nuclear program. Um, however, that may, that may change if Iran develops nuclear weapons after it would significantly change the uh, power dynamic in the region. That being said, all three are developing nuclear uh, energy at a private utility with the Russian state owned company, uh, Rosatom. Um, the entire supply chain is owned by Russia, including the spent fuel. Um, and this is part of Russia's uh, growth in the region. Uh, they are already one of the largest utility providers in the Middle East, um, and they look to expand their influence in the region. Uh, that concludes Group One's presentation, and I will see the floor to the next speaker. Um, thank you. So my group began um, analyzing the JCPOA by examining its failures. My group is known as the Breakout Group. And I will begin with first giving you an outline of our discussion of what is our working definition of breakout. Next, with that definition in mind, we will be identifying some JCPOA failures. And those failures then are um, used to analyze several different pathways for which are diversion clandestine sites, theft or purchase, and exit from the JCPOA. Lastly, we'll be looking forward after the JCPOA ends in 15 years, what is the political climate afterwards, and what must be done for a successful non-proliferation regime. All right, so what is breakout? The definition we use in our analysis uh, is obtaining enough weapons grade fissile material for one nuclear explosive package. 
We are aware that there is a broader definition that includes the time needed to build a credible nuclear arsenal. However, for our analysis, we will be using the first definition as it gives us the most minimum time for breakout. And with that, we can identify several failures. Here is listed five failures we use to critique the JCPOA. First, Iran obtains a weapon. Second, the breakout time is less than the response time. Currently, there is an estimate of a response time roughly of the order of four weeks. Then there is obstruction of IAEA inspectors and inaction of the global community to IAEA warnings. Lastly, after the JCPOA ends in 15 years, we must examine the political climate in the region and what is the current state. So with breakout, we also look at breakout time. Here's a plot of breakout time in terms of weeks versus the JCPOA years. During the JCPOA and its full enforcement, breakout time is estimated to be over 50 weeks or over a year. After the end of the JCPOA, there are estimates of breakout times that are as small as five weeks. This is with the worst case scenario in mind, where advanced centrifuge technology overperforms. Here we have a simplified diagram of breakout with the four branches that I've mentioned earlier. During our uh, small uh, break or after our discussion, we would like you to refer to our more extensive diagram here that has several more item specific branches to break up. So beginning with one of the branches, diversion, we will be looking at several materials as well as equipment that may be diverted from the facilities listed here. The facilities with the greatest concerns for breakout are the Natong enrichment facility, the research and development for for those facility, as well as our rock heavy water reactor. At these facilities, materials that will undergo verification and monitoring that our next group will discuss include US 6, spent fuel, and heavy water. What is more challenging, though, is monitoring equipment. Huge technology is a particularly challenging concern, as there will be over a thousand centrifuge um, centrifuges that will be placed in an idle state. Of these centrifuges, it is possible for parts to be scavenged from them and then used for a nuclear weapons program. Other facilities include the Bashir reactor, research reactors, and mining and milling. Most of these are very proliferation resistant. Clandestine sites, though less likely, are considered here. They're less likely due to their spatial signatures and our success in the past to detecting them, such as the first dough enrichment facility. However, they are still um, vulnerable to having parts scavenged from them as well as materials through secret pipes and secret rooms. Clandestine sites. Um, we'd like to state here include both within and externally to declared and undeclared sites. Theft and purchase are even more unlikely. However, theft is considered due to the volatile region, and purchase is more likely than theft due to a failure in the JCPOA or potential failure to the dispute resolution mechanism. This mechanism could allow for an accidental purchase through overloading the import um, through the Joint Commission approving too many um, import requests due to an overloaded system. There is also a very 
strong and um, felt presence of a black market that our next group, our next group coming up, um, the fourth group in our presentation will discuss. Then exiting J the JCPOA also concerns the dispute resolution mechanism. Through um, the JCPOA, any of the parties part of it are able to exit from it through several different venues. The most concerning is through placing a dispute to the Joint Commission in which the resolution time, 35 days, expires, at which time a party can enter the JCPOA. There is also concerns placed by definitions of sanctions a sanction that is removed versus sanctions that are still in place, specifically sanctions that target missile technology, weapons of mass destruction, and several personnel on the terror list, a terrorist list, are sanctions that are still in place. However, due to certain ambiguities, these sanctions could be taken to the dispute resolution mechanism process and if once again time expires, parties can exit the JCPOA. Looking ahead, one of the most uh, tremendous accomplishments of the JCPOA, besides extending the breakout time to a greater length than a year, is that the additional protocol will be ratified by Iran. Therefore, the IAEA will have uh, greater tools to its arsenal to investigate declared and undeclared facilities. During the lifetime of the JCPOA, we strongly recommend and encourage uh, global participation in an agreement that would follow up on the heels of the JCPOA to stabilize the climate 15 years from now. This would make the JCPOA an even stronger agreement. But this agreement means nothing without verification and monitoring that inspires confidence, which our next group will talk about. Uh, so having framed uh, the context of the JCPOA and discussed uh, uh, different breakout pathways, uh, we'd like now to discuss uh, how, how we're going to accomplish, how monitoring and verification will be accomplished in order to ensure that Iran is, remains compliant or is compliant with the JCPOA. Uh, here's a, an outline of different topics to be discussed. First, uh, I'll start with the prohibited activities, which we were discussed uh, in the previous section as the three major breakout pathways. Next, um, we'll uh, discuss new technology currently in the research pipeline that can be used to supplement the monitoring and verification mission. And lastly, briefly discuss a potential uh, stance by a uh, more radical stance that the U.S. intelligence community can take in its monitoring and verification mission. Right. So uh, just to go over again, the list of prohibited activities uh, for monitoring and verification and uh, ensuring that Iran is compliant with the Iran with the JC, within the, with the JCPOA. Uh, the, the three breakout, three major breakout pathways uh, for monitoring verification are diversion, clandestine activities, and facilities, and purchase and theft. To get into that a little more, uh, just uh, so the diversion, uh, diversion of uh, nuclear fissile material or associated equipment related to the fuel cycle or nuclear weapons production can occur at any stage of the fuel cycle. Um, in order, in the past, uh, in the past, uh, actually. Uh, the IAEA has, um, has been given the responsibility uh, for conducting the monetary and verification of all of Iran's nuclear facilities. In order, in order uh, to carry out its mission, the IAEA has a, a variety of uh, two, tools and methods at its disposal. The first of which is area sampling and analysis. Samples are collected in and around the, these declared facilities and shipped back to Vienna. For analysis, what they're looking for uh, here are any kind of fingerprint traces and uh, signature, uh, signatures of nuclear fissile material or the detained orders that could indicate a material is being diverted out of the facility or into different parts of the facility. Um, next uh, is the tagging and tracking of equipment and parts, as mentioned by the breakout uh, group. And in group uh, one, uh, there are several thousand uh, 
centrifuges that will just be sitting in a storage uh, idle and which could be used, which could be scavenged for parts for uh, larger uh, for covert activities or for uh, other illicit use. Therefore, the IEA is undertaking uh, the tracking and monitoring of all these uh, uh, parts in order to ensure that they stay where they're, where they're supposed to be and they're not being, they're not being used for any of the prohibited activities. Lastly, of course, the IEA monitors all parts of the fuel cycle. For example, here you have in the bottom left hand corner, you have a picture of two technicians standing over a reactor pool. And what they're doing here is using Cherenkov radiation to analyze the fuel assemblies in the, in the pool itself. This is, very this is a very beneficial technique uh, as it doesn't require, require the fuel, uh, fuel assemblies to be removed. Therefore, it removes any chance that Iran might have if they are cheating uh, to pull off the fuel assemblies and make any changes before the technicians come in. Another example of a monitoring, uh, a new monitoring tool the IE has, is, is a, has at its disposal uh, is a real time uh, monitoring of enrichment levels. For their centrifuge cascades. And this is accomplished. This can be a senior down the bottom right. It's is a steel, steel tube, which, allow, uh, which allows the rain and support I guess to pass through. And then you have uh, blue, uh, this blue box here, which contains your sodium iodide detector, which is able to detect the decay of your uranium and give you a real time, give IID inspectors real time uh, information about the emission levels and all. And all Iran's cascades at all of their equipment facilities. Uh, furthermore, uh, the IEA also employs uh, uh, remote cameras and sensors because while the number of inspectors has been increased from 50 to 150, it's still not enough to uh, ensure uh, uh, complete coverage of all the sites, 24 hour coverage, 24 hour coverage of all these sites. Uh, therefore, the IEA takes advantage of these remote cameras and sensors with with a tamper-proof design, and installs them in the facilities to keep, uh, to keep an eye on things as well. Now, it's important to uh, uh, note that since the IEA really is the primary actor in detecting and uh, verifying that Iran is not uh, partaking uh, in diversion, uh, it's important to say that the IEA relies heavily on U.S. technical and financial support, something like a third to the half its annual budget every year comes from the United States. Not to mention the, uh, the, the issue number of U.S. Uh, technicians and scientists uh, that are used, uh, employed by the IAEA and contracted by the IAEA in order to uh, develop, maintain, and deploy all of the different detection tools used by the IAEA um, uh, in inspection facility, in nuclear facilities, not only in Iran, but throughout the world. And it's also important to mention that <clears throat> that due to due to conditions uh, due to conditions that the IEA has with Iran and for allow for allowing these inspections to occur, Iran has barred uh, all United States of origin IEA inspectors from the country itself. So while no IEA US IEA inspectors are allowed in, uh, the US should continue to indirectly support the IEA, IEA with its technical uh, with its technical and financial. So next, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, clandestine activities. And just as a reminder of what they are, we're here we identify them as covert operations within declared nuclear facilities or military bases, uh, completely covert facilities off the grid, similar to the Fort Dillon Richmond plant. And uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the uh, theft and purchase, but the black market purchase of nuclear design material or related now, since the IEA is an organization, and as an organization, it's not equipped to uh, conduct, conduct any kind of monitoring and verification of clandestine activities, its responsi responsibility really falls to the United States Intelligence Committee. And in order to complete this, uh, the United States, uh, the USIC, can really take advantage of all the standard uh, uh, intelligence collection and analysis methods, particularly satellite. Satellite imaging and unmanned aerial reconnaissance imaging. These kinds of uh, these kinds of high precision photos would be able to uh, give give you macro signatures, uh, be able to track uh, track large uh, movement patterns of people, resources, and even construction projects that Iran might be Iran might be undertaking. If you couple, couple this coupling this with uh, thermal imaging from these sources as well, it allows you to identify activity 
uh, at, at previously inactive sites, um, just from their heat signatures, or to detect completely covert facilities. As such, large facilities will undoubtedly produce a, a lot of heat from all the equipment, people, and resources within the building. But we'll have to get out somewhere, and, we can, and if we can detect it, we can use it potentially as a signal. Um, next would be uh, signals intelligence or trying uh, intercepting the communications and trying to identify and track players within the Iranian government that could that could potentially um, be pursuing uh, these kinds of clandestine activities. These include high-ranking military officers, uh, government officials, and Iranian scientists. And the idea would be is to try to if you can tap, you're able to understand what's going on in the minds of of the upper echelons of the Iranian government, and you're able to couple that with uh, signal, with uh, imagery intelligence, you'll, you'll paint a much better picture of what's going on inside of Iran and be able to and have a better chance at uh, detecting any possible cheating on, on, on Iran's part. Uh, next, I would like to talk about uh, purchase and theft breakout pathway. Now, this is a particularly difficult one, uh, difficult pathway as the sheer size of the global economy, it, it, it's, it's, it's very, very large. <laughs> it's very large, dynamic, complex, and uh, it allows, allows for people to hide um, all kinds of purchases um, you know, and the existence of uh, uh, black markets and gray markets and uh, other, other such uh, resource networks like that, um, which <clears throat> Enables it, it really makes it very easy to hide a purchase. This has been demonstrated as North Korea has been partaking in this kind of kind of black market deals for some years. So it's not um, it's not unheard of that Iran would uh, Iran would not be able to do the same thing. So it's just uh, dealing with tagging with such a large so, you know such a large haystack. Um, it would be highly beneficial for the USIC to form a bulk of collaboration with other allied intelligence agencies. And national and international nuclear non-proliferation agencies, and really just to just kind of shore up their um, shore up the line, shore up the lines of uh, ensuring that fissile fissile nuclear material doesn't enter the black market, and material already exists in the market, and now we're capable of detecting it and interdicting it before it's delivered to the buyer. And in this particular case for uh, for Iran, uh, we decided or noted that it might be beneficial to. <clears throat> Really uh, follow Iranian terror connections and the Iranian intelligence agencies. Because these are the these are groups that operate within the nation uh, within, within Iran that are very used to conducting covert activities, covert operations. So you can get a, once again this kind of kind of falls back to the signal. These are signals intelligence communication and intercept. We're able to get inside get inside these organizations. We may be able once again uh, might have a better shot at detecting any possible cheating. So now that I've just uh, discussed the three main uh, breakout pathways, I'd like to talk, uh, discuss some new technologies that uh, we think could be game-changing in the monitoring and verification of uh, mission. The first of which is the anti-neutrino detector, which is a standoff detector. It's a detector that you can place at a uh, long distance and it can remotely uh, sense whatever, uh, whatever, whatever you're specifically looking for. In the case, we're looking for anti-neutrinos. Why anti-neutrinos? Well, the nuclear fissile material plutonium-239 and U-235 have, uh, have daughters in their decay chains that emit anti-neutrinos. And anti-neutrinos are very hard to shoot. They, are very, they, don't, they don't readily interact with matter, <clears throat> and they travel long, long distances. And, and since they're very hard to shield against, they're just kind of flying off, they're kind of flying all over the place, uh, and able to give us a chance to uh, uh, detecting we actually get ratios of plutonium 239 and 235 without actually having to go to the facility and, 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 and ask for ask access. Now, what are some of the limitations? Why is this not already deployed? Well, the first the first big issue is the issue of background radiation. There are all kinds of anthropogenic and cosmic, and cosmic sources of anti-neutrinos, particularly the sun is a huge source of uh, anti-neutrinos, and that must be dealt with uh, in order that must be that must first be dealt with before we're able to uh, use it as a sensitive de detection technique. Second, uh, the second and third point are kind of lumped together. Uh, this is the anti neutrino detectors are very large and very mobile, as illustrated by this picture here on the right. This is an anti neutrino detector, I think, in a mine shaft, which is 
and Mr. Scale is, those are a couple of technicians in a boat. So, not the most mobile, not the smallest detector. Definitely needs to, uh, definitely needs to continue to uh, only research support, but in the future, uh, for monetary reputation, it could be, it could prove to be very helpful. The next, uh, the next detection technique is an active interrogation technique called uh, the nuclear resonance fluorescence. This is where uh, you produce an interrogation beam, which is the ovary on the left side, it's collimated onto your sample or target. Uh, this interrogation beam will excite the nuclei in your target, and you detect the de-excitation of those of the said nuclei in the detector stations around. And this, this technique has been proven uh, for, uh, to be very effective at identifying design, nuclear design material, component 239, 235. And its um, proof concept has been shown and is currently still under it is currently still under development. Uh, the last uh, the last detection system that uh, we think could be a game changer would be the integration of nanomaterials as a, a scintillator detectors. So why nanomaterial detectors? Um, well, the biggest point is uh, cost saving, eliminating logistical burden, and improving sensitivity. Um, compared to other uh, scintillators like CZT or cadmium zinc telluride, much cheaper, much cheaper to manufacture these quantum dot, uh, these quantum dot nanomaterial detectors. You have, uh, like I said, you have improved sensitivity over sodium iodide detectors, and you eliminate the logistical burden that is carried by the high purity germanium detectors like HPGEs, because HPGEs are what, uh, must be cooled to liquid nitrogen temperatures in order to function. Um, and these quantum dot detectors only uh, can operate at room temperature, you no longer need to worry about that maintenance and logistical burden of the HPG. And actually, what we've been, what's been found as well is that the resolution is even, uh, of the quantum dots is comparable to the HPGD. That can be illustrated by this chart here on the right, where you have uh, normalized uh, counts versus energy. As you start by the, the, the green, you have a simple silicon semi, semiconductor detector, very poor resolution. You step up to the CZT, you see in the red, you see an improvement. And, and in blue and black, in blue, you have the HPGD detector, and in black, you have uh, your uh, quantum dot nano material detector. And you can, it's kind of hard to see because the, actually the lines are, are very well, are very well synced with one another. There's a lot of overlap and really demonstrating the resolution power of, of these detectors. Currently, a uh, proof of concept has been shown for these detectors and work is underway to improve consistency and uh, production methods. So lastly, I would uh, like to talk, uh, if you'd like to talk about uh, the proactive stance that can be taken by the USIC uh, in its monetary and verification goal, and that would be to uh, identify strategically latent technologies. These uh, technologies uh, are, would be particularly our technologies that are, are considered incredibly dangerous to US national security if developed by an enemy with both the technical capability of developing and deploying, as well as the intent to use that technology against America. Um, in the case, in the case of uh, uh, the Iran deal and monitoring and verification, there, this would be it. identifying technologies that Iran could use to by, either uh, bypass restrictions laid against it, or, you know, go against uh, if they find, for example, finding new uh, a new uh, method of enrichment or uh, other things like that. And so, it, it would be highly beneficial for the USI to see the work of all branches of government and private industry to kind of come together. Um, since the government possesses the technical know-how of nuclear weapons and the private sector knows how to use good and services in the complex global market, we bring these two together to form technical groups to investigate these uh, alternative breakout pathways. And now, uh, if you, um, I'll, I'll stress here that um, it's not just new and emerging technology that is, uh, should be the focus of these groups, but also how to use, uh, how uh, already available, already available uh, commercially Market ready technology could be repurposed, redesigned, and applied uh, to, to answer some uh, to, to shorten uh, to shorten the path to break up before. Um, um, next, from the from these technical groups, uh, you can apply these lessons learned and kind of scrub, scrub works. Any ideas to come out of these uh, uh, out of these uh, meetings uh, should really be explored to a proof of concept experiment to ensure that it works. You know, we don't want to waste our time looking for something. We know it's not going to work. Um, and 
all the, all the information gathered by from these technical communities and from the scrub groups uh, would really give the intelligence community an edge of protection. They would know what signatures to look for instead of blindly going out collecting intelligence and then coming back and now and analyzing. And then lastly, uh, we, well, we suggest that once this is applied on a national level, perhaps this could go to an international scale, incorporating allied intelligence agencies, um, as well as uh, uh, larger, larger uh, global corporations. And with that, uh, finishes uh, our section on monitoring and verification. Uh, next, next we'll uh, look we'll here on soft power option, appropriate economic and military stances. Uh, so we have sort of discussed uh, some of the uh, JCPOA and how it's laid out and how really the uh, effectiveness of some of the sanctions would be. But my group has looked into uh, another options, referred to soft power options that may be able to be avoid and alongside of these sanctions relief to improve the effectiveness of the JCPOA agreements, as well as uh, other uh, economic standpoints and correct military uh, stances to take alongside of these agreements. Uh, just for some definition purposes, soft power is really referred to as diplomatic or economic routes. Um, really, in umbrella term, that can be led to, to lead to a, uh, a, a change or a uh, reduction in the one for non for one material. Um, and then in our instance, we looked into uh, two or three programs, one of which was involving a uh, leveraging of the foreign trade, uh, as well as the uh, scientific and academic partnership aspects that can be maintained alongside of this nuclear uh, field. And um, I will be covering these, and my colleague Ishan will be covering the uh, intelligence aspects that might be uh, acquired might be acquired alongside as well as uh, the appropriate stances. Um, to start, foreign trade in the instance of JCPOA is looked at as uh, sanction relief. However, um, when you look further into JCPOA and Annex 3 particularly, there is some language there. Uh, the bilateral and multilateral cooperation of arrangements with Iran. Essentially, this language can pertain to how uh, other or other countries are trading um, across uh, Iranian businesses and other multinational corporations or uh, businesses outside of the Iranian borders. Um, this is an important aspect because sanctions are applied to the uh, economy as a whole. However, individual business practices are still um, needed and they were needed to be upkept and to be uh, dealt with um, in order to encourage businesses to come in. Uh, this has been an issue with Iran because they do not have a wholesome structure. They lack sometimes IP agreements where businesses outside of Iran are afraid of the uh, IP being stolen if they were to enter into Iran. And uh, they are, they also, um, lack general foreign investment. Um, and this is a very important issue when concerning uh, Part E of the Annex 3, because it's been looked at throughout the presentation. The nuclear, uh, really, energy sector is what's much, much, most, uh, sorry, most focused on with the JCPOA. However, there is an entire uh, field in nuclear outside of the fuel cycle, essentially. This could be nuclear medicine, uh, associated technologies would essentially be, for example, um, when looking at uh, fractures or damages in steel parts for things like airplanes, they use gamma rays in order to scatter off of that. Um, this sort of technology is, is beneficial, especially in the case of Iran, who already has this large uh, structure geared toward oil, which they are sort of looking toward improving the mechanical engineering as a whole, and nuclear may offer this to them. However, as I mentioned before, businesses and uh, those who are already up in the technology need to be able to enter this in order for them to, to see this. And uh, a way to do this is through the WTO, the World Trade Organization. 
Uh, Iran has already been expressed interest in this membership for quite some time. It actually applied in 1996. However, the U.S. had put political pressure within the WTO not to uh, have secession to full membership or even any membership status until 2005, uh, up, uh, after some nuclear negotiations were on with it. Um, however, in terms of recent events, it looks as though they are now on observer status, and the next steps are to assemble their working party, which is a party consistent of any WTO members, uh, as well as uh, develop a reform plan that will restructure their internal economics to agree with WTO governing legislation. Uh, this is crucial, especially to maintaining like IP production. Um, this way, foreign trade and foreign investment can actually occur within Iran. Uh, how, so what the uh, JCPOA can do, the Joint Commission can uh, actually leverage their benchmarks to a session as full membership. One of the, the ways is, as I said, they still need to uh, meet their working party. Um, and E3, EU plus three members, all of which are WTO members, have the right to participate in this working party. So if they position themselves within this party, they might be able to negotiate what has already been agreed with within the JCPOA to make sure that uh, economic standards line up with the new agreements that are already occurred. Another benchmark may be the reform plan. This is required by the WTO to assess whether or not they implemented the correct restructuring. Um, this could be very key if these specified uh, E3, EU, plus three WTO members um, took lead into this presentation, into the report presentation, as well as the assessments. Uh, by accessing these benchmarks and by uh, managing these benchmarks, we can somewhat pressure Iran into further st sticking with their agreement uh, because there is sort of this uh, issue, this uh, stigma with them attaining WTO membership. The reason why the US did not want them to do so before is because fear of uh, legal action. Once they did attain full membership, all the sanctions that were applied were feared to have been uh, illegal under WTO. Uh, but so it's actually ambiguous at the moment, but with the sanction relief provided within the JCPOA, it looks as though Article 10 of their GATT uh, governing body, the governing legislation, will uh, make sure that no legal action is pursued. However, it is still uh, very important that this uh, benchmark to be sort of drawn out into where the negotiations are further solidified. Um, and so, aside from the industrial aspects that the nuclear will offer them and that will entice them into agreeing further upon what they had agreed upon is the academic and scientific collaboration that could be held in the wrong. Um, the idea is to get the transparency to increase so that these intelligence and monitoring efforts can um, either be, as was mentioned before, we need to do possible research. So if there's further transparency, the research should be conducted and we could figure out uh, exactly uh, optimize the cycle essentially about how how uh, the Iranian nuclear program is actually uh, expired. To this, we could uh, establish these applied uh, nuclear programs as well. Um, one such program idea is to promote these uh, third party hosted research opportunities. Uh, and in general, you would have a third party university, not does not have to be the US, it could be somebody in favor of Iran, like Turkey. Um, to host the visiting scholars. And in this program, you would agree upon what nuclear research is being conducted. You would have a comprehensive list of the attendants of who, of who will be attending this, and you'll create a database within there that will actually be able to be used uh, sort of as an insider as to what they are researching um, to, for intelligence purposes. You will also need to look into expediting the visas. Um, of course, there's language within the JCPOA uh, uh, regarding visas of uh, member of uh, uh, like military leaders and government leaders. However, in this instance, you would have to uh, make sure that the visas were uh, correctly applied. 
and you would want to later look down the road and throw the money research between the U.S. and Iran. Um, the U.S. is conducting quite a bit of research toward nuclear. We helped found it, so it would be beneficial to them as well as to us to have that uh, database that was opened up to a third party be opened up to us so that we could also see more detail without having to go through back channels. Um, this sort of uh, program is actually very beneficial, more toward, more toward in, uh, those who are going to be in a position to make decisions for the future of Iran. So it would be very, very uh, pertinent to access the, those exactly for that purpose. Uh, looking again at the JCPOA, the economic sanction reliefs that were mentioned um, through Article 18, 18 to 33, as well as in Annex 2, uh, very broadly have this uh, language that might suggest that the sanctions applied are going to affect all of Iran, which will include a lot of the individuals, not so much the government officials. So another stance could be toward looking at smart sanctions, which would be applied toward the military leaders. Um, these sort of sanctions could be as simple as uh, not inviting specific leaders who are opposing the agreements that they had already made to uh, advance. It could be freezing financial assets or transactions between us and them. It could be um, essentially those targeted toward the correct officials and not towards the populace as a whole. Um, and looking further into these sanctions, it's seen that uh, Russia and China um, had in the past possibly engaged in black market trading, um, and they were not as uh, relevant into the sanctions. So in the future, if they would like to um, uh, gain in on these uh, GCPOA agreements, um, it might be best to put some pressure toward them in order to ensure that as a whole, the agreements come to the terms. And with that, Sean, take over. So um, I'll be talking more about kind of some harder power options that we have in order to um, reduce the likelihood of success of any efforts for Iranian nuclear weapons development. So in the category of intelligence and monitoring efforts, uh, what we're really focusing on here is, again, the idea when Secretary Perry um, signed the JCPOA, he said that this isn't a deal based on trust, but one based on verification. Um, there isn't any kind of uh, intention here for the JCPOA to be an all encompassing uh, beginning towards like a, a, a relaxation of tensions with Iran. There are still significant areas of contention and disagreement between the two countries. But what we want to do is look at what stances we can have with regard to intelligence and monitoring here that will allow us to ensure the success of this treaty in its limited sphere. Um, there are three policies that we'll be recommending, but uh, really policies within the free sphere that we'll be recommending. Firstly, we're looking to look at reorganization within the intelligence community, of uh, the United States intelligence community, to best achieve success. Secondly, we are advocating for a focus on Iranian weapons development, even in what we would currently consider the conventional sphere. And finally, we want to build on what uh, group three has talked about and um, advocate for more options that we can have in terms of monitoring and verification efforts. So moving on to um, reorganization internally. Uh, this has been a consistent suggestion um, throughout like, the history of the uh, establishment of the American security apparatus, that there needs to be a greater deal of coherence um, within the intelligence community as to the recommendations that are offered. And there needs to be a consistent effort made towards minimizing internal conflicts. It's worth emphasizing here that these aren't necessarily like unique or new recommendations. Similar, um, uh, similar efforts have been talked about in the context of pre when, when previous intelligence failures, systemic failures in the American security apparatus have come up. But for the uh, in ensuring the success of the JCPOA, it is worth re-emphasizing the need to minimize any internal conflict and conflicting interpretations of the intelligence that we see on the ground in Iran. Our first suggestion here is that we want to move towards emphasizing a need-to-know basis for any intelligence that is produced uh, with, with, regard to, uh, um, with regard to reports of Iranian nuclear weapons development. Uh, what, what this means essentially is that rather than um, offer, uh, offer analysis from the intelligence community for explicit public consumption, we want only those who explicitly within the American uh, government establishment in the executive branch and in the legislature 
those who need to know will have access to um, the reporting. Moving on to the reporting itself, one thing we want to do is protect again our intelligence intelligence community from political retaliation or from seeking out any explicit political purpose from their reporting. And standardized reporting helps out in this case. And what we mean here is both standardization in terms of the in terms of the frequency that we have reports released. So every every well, every six months or so we have a report that updates us on what is going on with the Iranian nuclear establishment, as well as any event-based reports. So in the event of, say, a, a new political leader coming to power, the, the demise of the Ayatollah, the implications of these on such events, on any developments within the Iranian nuclear establishment will need to be reported. As for the reports themselves, we also think that there is a need to kind of look at the, 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 the formatting of what is being recommended as well. And explicitly here, we advocate for a separation of kind of the objective facts and analysis that is being produced on the ground in Iran, as well, and then what, uh, and then offering kind of the intelligence agents perspective on these events in a separate section, in order again to, to ensure that there is protection from political retaliation. This again has been a consistent thing throughout the history of any kind of nuclear analysis, where you see since the Nixon administration, since the mid 20th century, efforts have been made to kind of embellish analysis in one way or another in order to serve it in an explicitly political purpose. And what we want to try and move towards is ensuring that agents within the intelligence community do not feel an explicit need to do this and uh, um, not feel an explicit need to do this. Moving on to what we want our focus on in, in Iran to be with regards to intelligence gathering, uh, we think it's particularly important even when we take out nuclear weapons from the equation, to look at why Iran has been making the kind of moves that it has with regards to both developing nuclear weapons and um, um, asserting itself in the Middle Eastern region. Um, our interpretation here is that part of this is part of, partly like that emanate from a desire to assert itself as kind of an equal, if not the supreme power in the Middle Eastern region in a way that Iran has not been for a significant um, duration of the 20th century and the 21st even perhaps. So when we look at kind of why Iran has been developing the weapons that they use, even restricting any even restricting any developments in the nuclear sphere does not necessarily mean that this restricts Iranian ambitions in, with regard to any belligerent, any belligerent stance that Iran wants to take. An example of this is the recent testing of the Imad missile. Um, this is again a local warhead that can be modified to fit on a nuclear warhead that has been tested and proudly proclaimed by the Ayatollah as a sign of the kind of development that Iran would want to be focusing on. So with, in, with this in mind, what we want to be doing is monitoring progress and capabilities and focusing our intelligence efforts specifically on Iranian weapons development. This will also means that we don't just want to be distinguishing between, say, this, these are kind of the categories of nuclear weapons that we see and conventional weapons, but also looking at a further timeline, 10 years out, 15 years out when the JCPOA, the terms of the JCPOA, the terms of the JCPOA lapse, what options that Iran, Iran has at that stage to convert these putatively conventional weapons into nuclear warheads, like a modified Imad missile maybe. Um, in order to do this, we want to focus on creating specific develop, development pathways within the intelligence community collaborating with academic and scientific experts. One way we want to go about this is gathering the intelligence that we have about current Iranian weapons development efforts and trying to repeat that process in a parallel manner um, within the intelligence community here in order to try and forecast out what kind of developments may be left, what kind of developments current Iranian weapons capability may lead to in the future in an in, in immediate term, uh, intermediate term, as well as in the longer term. Finally, with regards to um, their intelligence um, capabilities and the intelligence community, what we want to do, we'll emphasize here with regards to monitor, monitor, monitoring and verification technology, is that we're trying to build on say, what we've already talked about previously, which we had what Jeff presented. And something that worth emphasizing again is that what the IAEA, with American assistance, can be incredibly effective when access is granted. But what we also want to do as the American intelligence community is try and look for ways to augment and bolster our capability when there is an explicit access grant, whether it's a secret facility or in a longer term range, like after the 15 year timeline of the JCPOA has lapsed. 
And the ideal way to do this, we believe, is by augmenting the concessions that we have already gained with Iran in the JCPOA in exchange for economic relief, in exchange for the lifting of visas and um, a less belligerent um, American stance towards Iran. There have been significant concessions granted with regards to the kind of inspections that Iran will allow on its own soil. In order, one way we, can, we want to build on this is by using these same concessions as part of other diplomatic deals we may want to eventually think about signing with Iran, building on our soft power capabilities, as Caleb has talked about, for example, American acceptance and sponsorship of Iranian accession to the WTO, for instance, could be made contingent on signing a, a, on an explicit agreement to allow a similar kind of inspections past the 15 year timeline of the JCPOA. In addition, we want to emphasize the need to focus on technology development in three distinct spheres drone based technology, manned vehicles, and personnel based technology in order to augment our intelligence gathering capabilities and utilize currently existing key pathways with, uh, with, with, with both with our current technology capabilities and our international allies in order to monitor, in order to succeed in regards to monitoring and verifying what exactly is going on on the ground with Iran. Moving on to an appropriate military stance. Again, what we want to emphasize here is that there is a, what we want to emphasize here is that there isn't necessarily going to be a need for us to explicitly advocate for military action in Iran. Um, and our, our focus here is on ensuring restraint. I'll be talking about three separate policies for uh, three separate focus areas here. Firstly, on the need why we need to be prioritizing diplomatic resolutions with regards to, uh, to with regards to um, ensuring the success of the JCPOA. Secondly, how an appropriate and effective military stance should include a focus, an explicit focus on cyber warfare capabilities. And finally, I'll be discussing any recommendations for how we can enhance our capabilities in cyberspace. So moving on to prioritizing diplomatic resolutions. Uh, we need to recognize, firstly, as we've talked about already, that there are several severe non-military responses available for us in order to address any Iranian transgression of the terms of the JCPOA. Whether these are sanctions, whether these are unilateral sanctions or multilateral sanctions, these are what have brought Iran to the table in the first place. And the threat of this kind of snapback could be enough in the event of a transgression. If it isn't, uh, we do also have planned, and we have our half in the box as the United States Defense Establishment has planned kinetic responses, particularly the realm of airstrikes against particular Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, these are undoubtedly effective. Um, Israeli airstrikes against Syrian nuclear facilities, for instance, played a critical role in ending kind of any further hope for Syria to develop their own nuclear weapons earlier in the 21st century. Um, however, what we also need to recognize is any kind of kinetic response like this, having airstrikes would create collateral damage that is too high in the case of Iran. Uh, not only is this not only is this due to where these sites are located in terms of civilian access and any damage and major to infrastructure and harming those people who we do not want to harm in terms of the, the regular, say, Iranian um, public, but also kind of when we consider the optics of what an airstrike, an American-led airstrike in Iran would look like, the, the, the antagonizing effects of something like this would be far too high. If we take the example of the Bordeaux site, for instance, this is located close to the city of Qom, which is considered the theological heart of Shia Islam. An analogy to kind of bombing or, or any kind of kinetic response on the Bordeaux site would be, for instance, if the American military were to go into, say, Mecca in Saudi Arabia, and, uh, and um, engage in a similar kind of attack. Previously, when there has been American military intervention, Mecca that hasn't led to exactly ideal responses for both for American national security. So this is something we want to avoid and only use as an absolute last resort because ultimately what it would do is it would do is hamstring any effect and the positive effects of the JCPOA, which includes an American reorientation in the Middle East. And in fact, further entangle us in the kinds of conflicts that have proved to be debilitating in the past couple of decades. Uh, moving on to a uh, focus on cyber warfare. So, if a kinetic response is a last resort, and ideally we want a diplomatic resolution, this does not mean that there isn't a place for the military to play an active role in ensuring, um, uh, in creating a complementary stance towards ensuring JCPOA success. 
a focus on cyber warfare allows us to do this in a very effective manner. Um, for example, one attack, one example instance of this that offers a useful historical precedent, a precedent is the Stuxnet attack that took place a few years ago. Um, so going back to kind of looking at what the Stuxnet is essentially a piece of malware or a virus that was installed onto uh, nuclear centrifuges, uh, on the centrifuges in nuclear plants in Iran, which prevented them from functioning in an ideal manner. Now it is alleged that um, the United States was involved in this attack, and similarly that the Israel was involved in this attack, but rather than kind of focusing specifically on who perpetrated this, the United States never um, admitted to it doing this. What this does suggest is that there are manners in which we can engage with Iran, with Iranian nuclear capabilities in the event of any transgression that do not require us to explicitly um, come in via airstrikes or any kind of cyber um, kinetic response. Um, our own cyber capability program has also been confirmed. And while there hasn't been any acknowledgement or any indication publicly that there was involvement in, say, the perpetration of the Stuxnet attack, um, the creation of the US Cyber Command recently and um, uh, uh, the ordering of attacks against um, ISIS forces and ISIS networks um, suggest that the United States already has this capability. And what we want to suggest is we focus on how we can enhance these capabilities in cyber space. So there's three recommendations that I want to conclude with here. Firstly, it's again revising our regulatory oversight. Part of the JCPOA success also involved ensuring that there is a public acceptance of our stance and a public recognition that this does not necessarily mean we're acquiescing to the demands of the country that we consider a state sponsor of terrorism for the past few decades. What we suggest here is building on all the legislation that's already been passed in both houses, like the Cybersecurity um, Information Sharing Act 2014, and creating greater legislative oversight for any uh, for any um, cyber um, cyberspace efforts that the United States military engages in, okay. and having, for example, through the creation of two attacks that are perpetrated by the U.S. Cyber Command. Secondly, we want to focus on developing and enhancing um, domestic public-private partnerships in the sphere of cyberspace. Uh, Stuxnet, the Stuxnet virus, for example, was not found by a government agent or by an extensive government operation, but by a private actor who was a computer security expert. And it would be important to leverage these kind of relationships in order to bolster the American national security stats. Finally, we also want to ensure that there's further international collaboration in the sphere of cyberspace. Um, it's important to recognize here as well that there hasn't, there isn't kind of like with, unlike with nuclear weapons, there isn't a declaratory policy that any nation has established or agreed to with regard to the use of cyber weapons or any kind of cyber warfare capability. This isn't an ambiguity we necessarily want to or need to address immediately. But what we would suggest is that there should be a recognition between the United States and key allies, the P5 plus one in particular, of the kind of nature of cyber attacks that are perhaps considered unacceptable. When um, China's leader Xi Jinping visited um, the United States in 2015, there was an agreement signed with President Obama that, would, that suggested that there wouldn't be any American support or vice versa, Chinese support of a cyber attack on each other's, within each other's networks that explicitly seek to kind of steal economic trade secrets or compromise each other's security. A similar agreement and an acknowledgement that there needs to be some form of cooperation, however you want to specify it, with other countries in the P5 plus one would be particularly helpful in the case that the United States doesn't want to explicitly publicly acknowledge or um, or simply just engage in, uh, in a cyber um, attack against Iranian nuclear capabilities in the event of any transgression. Finally, I want to end with a quote from the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Martin Dempsey. Um, again, the, this is the idea that we wanted to reiterate throughout our presentation that there are significant diplomatic options that are available through the JCPOA that allow us to relieve the risk of a nuclear conflict with Iran. And that is our express purpose here. Military options, while available, while potentially effective, are not as desirable, nor as extensive or exhaustive as what we can do diplomatically. With that, I just want to hand it back to Shreya. So, um, that concludes our presentation. Uh, very broadly speaking, these would be our policy, our policy recommendations would fall under these categories, uh, namely, to continue negotiations with Iran, 
uh, to invest in advanced technology for uh, detection and uh, in, term, in the context of monitoring and medical and verification to improve practices within the US intelligence community and to develop appropriate soft power options and appropriate hard power options. Um, and you take any questions if you have. In your soft, by the way, excellent work. Uh, in your soft power options, you're counting on are being able to have access to the Iranian academics and scientists and researchers. If you look at it from the Iranian side, how open they would be, as if there are issues on the ground there, and maybe I understand they would form But you know, from the academic standpoint, yes. the collaborations that have been fostered with Iranian universities has been open no matter the curve throughout the sanctions that have been imposed. And so there have, so through the past nine or 10 years, these academic collaborations have been fostering and they have been growing until the recent sanctions came along. And even though there were still collaborations, they leveled up at some point. And so that's what we're trying to do with these uh, academic collaborations. Someone can chip in if I'm wrong. But uh, I think the idea for investing in new technologies is for the US to know for itself that uh, something is off. How we address that would be uh, a, a separate question. Does that make sense? Um, I have some questions about the new technologies. Um, but you said that the focus is Oh, first of all, excellent presentation. Yeah, that's <laughs> 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 
Um, so for the NRF and for the nanomaterials, I was wondering if you could give some examples for where those technologies would be used. Because I don't think any applications were provided. Um, so nanomaterials and electrodes are basically using like cold detectors. So it's kind of like just to enhance outdoor current detectors. So where are those detectors used? And what are the limitations of that? So for the bullet, um, if um, the nuclear resonance, the nuclear resonance portraits is the space for X perturbation, so it can be at four or at four, and then for the detectors, it can it can basically be used for um like where we use XPG like and some pilot, like basically like how we could outrun pilot to monitor the um enrichment. So it can be that way. Okay, so online enrichment. Yeah, to monitor enrichment and Okay, so where does the uh, order monitor fit into this problem? Um, so basically, if if there is like um, with, sorry, I, I didn't really get your question. So. Um, so with order monitoring, like I'm assuming you're talking about progress screening on. Um, so, what problem within the context of this deal is that solved? So, that I think basically is to monitor if there is like metric that is being like um, going to other parts of the okay, so diversion. Right. So, was when we were looking at kind of what standoff technology to look at where things might be hidden, um, what technologies could be used to okay. investigate that. Great. Um, another question is, I didn't hear anything about new technologies for seals and monitoring. And for all of the safeguards workshops that I've done, I, it just seems like all of it comes down to material accountability and like looking at cameras and making sure that no one is entering that room. So do you see any room for development in those areas or what you suggest? Um. I think overall, uh, I mean, a camera is a camera. I mean, all you can really, uh, I mean, all you can really do is put it in a better box. You can't break into it. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know how. You, I mean, if, if from a cybersecurity point, you have to ensure that the data line can't be hacked. I mean, that's I mean, that's a huge, I mean, that's a huge issue um, in and of itself as well. So I mean, uh, obviously, working on uh, those fronts can be beneficial as well because if, if they can get if they can get into your data line, they can they can do whatever they want. Uh, invisible um, cut the feed, put a loop feed on. Um, in, in terms of uh, in terms of remote sensors, in terms of remote sensors, um, I can't recall anything off the top of my head, but I think it also just comes down to being able to to ensure that you we, we can put it someplace, we can put it um, uh, in, in the area we want and make sure and, and ensure that it's not tampered with when they come back and check it. Um, and part of that is part of that is uh, uh, relying and just relying on uh, the fact that they haven't figured out a way to defeat what we have now. Um, I guess kind of going on that one is um, I mean if we were to just list you know new technologies you'd probably make your own entire presentation on that alone. Mm -hmm. So um, if you really wanted to focus on something pertaining to the Iran deal, what, where are the holes in the Iran deal that you actually see new technologies being useful for you to implement? I mean, so so for example, um, I mean, the stand, the stand off intrusion detector could be used for remote, remote monitor. Um, I mean, all of all of the uh, all of the IEA's uh, power and ability relies on. Uh, Iranian, Iranian, uh, Iranian compliance. You know they have to let them in the facility. They can't say no, and they are just discuss they can put people back out of things. So being able to being able to remotely look at fuel assembly, being able to like be able to remotely look at fuel assemblies, perhaps without their knowledge, um, or being able to look at things remotely without them having to take it apart for us, uh, take it apart for the inspectors to to conduct their inspection. I think it'd be very beneficial because it's in those gaps of time where you know, I think where we think you know they can come in, change change whatever they you know change something to hide whatever, whatever they're doing, and potentially fool the inspectors on the field. Okay. Um, so I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.
So one comment on the anti-neutrino detectors, uh, the fact that we know so little about anti-neutrinos has made it really difficult for us to actually use that as a technology, just because we can't actually be solved using the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But that was just a comment. I didn't say it was ready tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> but it's up to I have a question that. Um, so, 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 so we have a bit of a, um, uh, a fork in the road here to make a democratic decision. We have quite a few pizzas outside <laughs> that were good at about six. They smell really good. So we have <laughs> since 35. <laughs> uh, we can continue. I think we have quite a few additional questions to discuss. I bet we can go at least 25 minutes more at least. So should we continue and the pizza might get a little cold? <laughs> or should we run the risk of getting the pizza, but we can be here and still sustain a high level of discussion? Let the question over stay. Sorry? We can let the question over stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
how can we actually ensure you know you guys had that really nice chart in the first 12 years of the JCPOA there's this almost year breakout timeline so then after that it drops off very quickly so how can we ensure that after the very active JCPOA activity uh, that Iran doesn't start to see with nuclear weapons and very quickly um, that's why we strongly advocated that during the 15 year period that we live underneath the JCPOA, um, we use every diplomatic mean we have available to uh, create a new global agreement because that, that would be one of our greatest achievements alongside uh, the JCPOA. Um, they have rights under the NPT to pursue research and development into centrifuge technology and that just showcased what would be the worst case scenario um, which is what we need so that we can develop competitive advanced technology and detection and verification i think you actually touch on one of like the biggest challenges because all of the approximations made by the jcpoa are dependent on the efficiency of the current ir1 centrifuges mm -hmm. uh, and that's how the number of the quotas for the number of centrifuges that can be operational are also set. But starting at year eight, uh, Iran can do both R&D and manufacturing of higher efficiency centrifuges, right? And so all of these numbers and all these anticipations are kind of based on this lower efficiency rate. Um, and so I think that actually there's a couple of places that one can focus for monitoring verification. I think that, for example, the footprint's already small. For the IR1 centrifuges, you'll have like, um, it's like about 20 meters squared for a cascade of a thousand, okay? And so that means that in the course of a year, you would, I mean, you'd need something the size of a tennis, tennis field, basically, tennis court, um, to store your centrifuges. And so as you have a higher enrichment rate, you're gonna need even less space, right? So improving the, I would say, automated verification and monitoring uh, through satellite imagery that they discussed and trying to find clandestine sites and opportunities for diversion is going to be a key key point. I think actually another key point that um, is hidden a little bit more in the economics of it is that the agreements to purchase fully fabricated fuel assemblies does not um, add to the stockpile limits. It's not confined within the stockpile limits. So the limits of the Iranian stockpile for highly rich uranium is separate from that Permitted that you're permitted to purchase. And so if you can find ways of either reusing or sequestering off parts of these highly rich fuel cycle, uh, fuel assemblies, that's actually also a major leaping point that doesn't add towards the stockpile of the nation. Okay. If I could just add one thing. I think that we highlighted a large part of the impetus for the soft power options for the project, um, which is to sort of engage communities that aren't explicitly engaged in the JCPOA so that there's a level of investment of the nations, which increases the moment of inertia for the, for the steel so that it can't just, through regime change in Iran or in the United States, change everything. Um, so engagement of the academic community, uh, scientific, but also there are some cultural influences you can have through the collaboration suggested by the soft power options. Um, I think that's sort of the JCPOA allows for an increased level of engagement um, in various ways. Great. So, kind of continuing, uh, instead of a uh, instead of rules and regulations, uh, cultural change that half the JCPOA can work with that. I mean, we also had some more explicit things like economic, um, not necessarily partnership, but economic, like the uh, Iran potentially joining the WTO. Um, that was sort of increase the uh you want to we want to play you don't want to play to Iran's interests per se or want to change their interests for them. and um if we can make the best way for them to improve their economy not be through show of power via nuclear weapons then that may have lasting power so just a little bit it's kind of a fundamental part of the GCP as such where what the dark document really argues, right? and what a lot of actually foreign policy experts argue as well is that these these engagement narratives have worked in the past, and over the past very different situations, they worked with, you can argue, 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 you can
right now. We, there are situations that come in from the end of the nuclear and biological program. If you get into economic and particularly on the that is a part of the national defense war, the way it's a security guarantee is for nuclear power, right? And just um, in DC, like Iran is trying to develop relationships with nuclear powers of various sorts. For example, the United States undermines uh, the security of our European allies, right? Where you know Russia can't new Germany and not expect the United States to retaliate in probably a comparable capacity, right? So do we extend security guarantees to Iran? I don't think we should, but I, I could imagine another country taking um, but that that's the law, that's kind of the logical basically way we're pretty engaged we can, as you said, fundamentally change their interests and sort of shift as a sense to because it does support the Southern Agreement and the time frame. We really don't have a mechanism to uh Solve the number of leaders. I have a question. Going back to the original, the original description of the last project, and so I'm going to pretend I'm a presidential candidate. I'm here seeking advice and developing my foreign policy platform. And uh, I just gave this briefing, and I'm going to say, I'm going to role play a little bit. I'm going to say, okay, so you're telling me that. This agreement basically increases the breakup time from a few months to around a year. And so, what we, what we buy ourselves is a decade of a year long breakout. Then, pretty much as soon as the agreement's over after 10 to 12 years, that goes right back down again. So, a lot of you, I think 90% of what, what you presented and presented very well was about how to make the agreement more effective. But I want to go along and say, is this, is this really worth doing? Is this, do I start off my presidential campaign with a key national you know, foreign policy speech? And do I come out in favor of this or do I come out against this? Convince, tell me what you recommend me, what you think, what, what you think I should do. Is this really a good agreement? Is this something I want to support strongly on day one or is this, is this worth doing? Is it simply, Increasing breakout for a decade good, and what does that imply about the future of arms control? Are we, are we picking up arms control and we're just saying slowing someone down for a decade is, is, is good enough, and that's what arms control is? What, what, what is your overall policy recommendation to this presidential candidate about the stance they should take on the Iranian region? Oh, I'll, I'll start off with um, so. I would say that yes, this agreement is good because not only is it extending the breakout time, which allows us to respond if we decide later down the line to actually build a weapons program, we can respond with much greater time. But it also opens up a diplomatic channel with Iran, which is extremely important to future agreements. So while this is a stepping stone and from your eyes, it's only extending breakout time to a year, it's getting them to the table, it's getting them talking, it's bringing them into the international community, making them a part of the economic world. And, you know, it's making, it's instead of isolating them like North Korea, where they're impervious to sanctions, it's bringing them into the fold. It's getting our people talking to their people. It's improving ties. And that's really what the cornerstone of this is doing. So you recommend that the platform should be, this is a practical approach to engagement it's really, it, this is a, it sounds like it's a means to engagement, not a, not a means to. It's, it's not the end. Yeah. It is the first step, and part of what you should be doing is working on what the next step is going to be. So now that you, we have all these software options where you can have more engagement, to work on those for the future. Okay, so that, I understand. So maybe I'm going to do and I go, I, I accept it. I, I, my platform should be engagement better than isolation. Isolation did work well in North Korea. Uh, you know, and I think as president, I'd, I'd rather engage with Iran. But I have to be ready to answer critics of this agreement who are going to say, all you're doing is opening up this spigot of finance, money coming in for a decade. 
And I think some of you raised the point, we had exactly what the point that now you can spend a decade working on the complementary technologies, missiles, and truck at us. That you can that there's missile development going on. What was so soft? So you can make the job of the job. We've done that with a simple part of devices. The theory of 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 the the
uh, yeah, what's the right term? Um, uh, this sort of higher the standing where you try to resolve diplomatically, but now you're sort of more free to take military action. What, why? How does engaging in the agreement make a military strike more effective later? So one key <laughs> thing is limiting the number of such pages, uh, limiting the number of targets. I mean, it's kind of like uh, we talked about all the where we get it, where we have like a bunch of different places that we have to do weapons so that the enemy cannot quickly destroy our capabilities. We have the ability to help you. You're also centralizing the infrastructure, right? <clears throat> like the mechanical and physical infrastructure for both manufacturing and production of various levels of enrichment. You're saying under the agreement there? Under the agreement, okay. right? You're centralizing it in the for example, for all enrichment purposes. You're centralizing the resources which you're permitting, right? For R and D and manufacturing at Purdue. And by doing that, you're basically sorry, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting, but how about undeclared facilities? Yeah. I mean so, I mean, that's always a concern so far as actually you guys mentioned in your questions, we've been quite successful at identifying undeclared facilities. And so I think that really the incentive in a lot of, in a big way is that by permitting a certain financial capability and a certain manufacturing capability and hard industrial capability, you're in fact um, incentivizing investment at a specific location. And it's not to say that there won't be diversion. It's not to say that there won't be clandestine sites, it just incentivizes for their scalability also the uh, the start of much of that progress. So the policies, the platforms developing and take, put a stick with the agreement, it's, it's better, better policy to engage in isolate. The moderate Iranian regime may, may be open to, to, to this agreement now and to not pursuing other Weapons should we fail. The agreement itself gives us a better chance at one consolidating targets and and having fewer such targets to have to go after. And the corollary to that is, and we think we'll do a very good job at being able to identify undeclared facilities. So that it's not we're not concerned that there's an extra five thousand centrifuges underground somewhere that we can't hit because that would be a total game changer. And also, a total, total game changer. you wouldn't need five thousand. Most likely. I just use five thousand because that's the number allowed. Oh, does that somebody did the you know lays out the calculation about the rate you need for one year breakout? Uh what about okay, so that's something my policy one point really quickly. So okay. here's what you're missing though, right? What you're missing in that is that the DCPOA is also an agreement for US national defense, right? That's what it provides in that first 10 years. And that's what that one year standpoint breakout time really is this is an opportunity for national defense and then that makes space for arms control but you can't really go yeah so when we talk about the breakout time yeah. right we talk about setting breakout time as longer than our ability to respond that our, right. than our response time right. and our response time is our ability to implement national defense policies right so we gives us time to military capability or diplomatic, uh, take diplomatic so, 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 so. Exactly. And basically that's the argument, I think politically, like, from a political standpoint as the president elect for the JCPOA's one year timestamp being enough for the 10 year period. Would you say like, if, 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 we, if there was no agreement and we just went on with the pre agreement status quo for 10 years, you would expect the breakout time to go down and our options become more and more limited in terms of military or and in fact, it didn't even there. have to go down. It was already in the scale of weeks. We can't respond in that time. So I would also say that we live in a country which, unlike uh, European powers of the 19th century, um, will, it loses willingness to go to war unless it perceives itself as having its national survival threatened at a loss of a fraction of percentage of our population. So, and I mean, for example, I'll look at Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the, 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 if, if we historicize these conflicts, they're actually uh, very small as a percentage of human population lost, right? But the approval rating for entire political establishment, as it were, inherently collapsed with these conflicts, right? So I would say that this agreement, the Pacific Passing Job, is actually going to quote the National Defense Universe Press correctly and say that it uh, offers a greater emphasis on human transparency 
into the program capabilities of outlier states, uh, which is a top priority for the 2010 post nuclear posture deal. And so the idea here is that uh, this increased transparency actually offers its own its own set of rewards, right? Because if you are rather than the left, you are running a country that is simply unwilling to go for at the moment. And this is your next best option. Great. Yeah, okay. Take the deal with engagement, not isolation, moderate regime, limited number of targets, consolidated targets, increased transparency, and overall increased time, uh, the breakout time, or increased time to respond by various means versus if we imagine the future in the next decade without the agreement, we have you know, fewer options for response. And so you can try to couch it in a way as a reasonable, it still includes military, a military option in a way, but it gives you more military options or better military options. That would be a nice summary package included in the paper. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, that, that, but I, I want to get that, that original point. Like, some, some, somebody comes in or wants to develop a policy question. Right? Yes. You know, and, uh, then, then the details of how it's how it be implemented would be important, and they'd have to be able to defend all those things. But, but I just, yeah. I have a few questions for the district, and then maybe I'll get also to the 30,000 for the also. First question is actually something Ian said, which is honestly, honestly didn't uh, fully understand. Uh, you said that any member, is that of the Security Council or of the Security Council plus Germany, could go to the UN Security Council and say, these guys are in violation. And that would automatically call a snapback. But then, then later you talked about the Security Council perhaps voting on it, where there would be a veto of members of the Security Council. Can you just clarify that? Okay, I think the first comment was actually in the first comment mentioned about automatic setbacks. I think that was in reference to IAEA not being given access to non internet sites. I'm not entirely sure on the process because it was pretty complicated, Absolutely. but essentially, like, as long as they're on the spot, so, so the IAEA, so if you want to visit that facility, Iran says no. That automatically triggers what? Uh, so I'm not entirely sure of the details. Uh, there's a lot of just you know they have like X amount of days to respond and stuff like that. Yeah, let's say you know it's clear they're not going to provide access. I believe they do it. Um, I, I can't remember how much. Anybody but, else? Yeah. So the just uh -huh, it goes to the Joint Commission, which is all the E3 slash E plus three. And Iran, they all have a seat on the Joint Commission. And it goes to the Joint Commission. The Joint Commission are all the signatories of the agreement. Yeah. So it's yeah. E5 plus one plus Iran. And the EU. Yeah. And the EU. Yeah. And um, they they have a, it can be up to a 35 day review period, depending on how many okay. like three reviews, et cetera. Okay. And then if at the end of that 35 days there's no resolution, right. the yeah. The sanctions will automatically go back into place unless somebody has to actively veto the sanctions. So that's to get around the usual consensus that has to be taken to avoid someone like Russia that are trying to say, no, we don't want to enact the sanctions again. So they're automatically placed and then they have to be executed. That, if that makes sense. So notably, actually, also the any contracts that private companies engage with Iran. Uh, are committed to remain even if the JCPOA is no longer in effect. And that is one, one premise behind that is to incentivize um, companies to agree to, to provide various facilities and services to Iran in accordance with the JCPOA, because if you didn't have that assurance, then as a company, you might not take the risk in the event that the JCPOA was canceled outside of the contract period. Um, but notably also that, that enables certain financial and manufacturing resources to continue irrespective of the state of the JCPOA. And one of the criticisms of the agreement, um, both before it was signed and after, was that snapback, because snapback would be feasible because only the United States would take a hard line if they 
really works, the language, that every one of the European countries have big economic incentives uh, in uh, Iran, especially Germany and France. Uh, and the Russians also, because the Russians are allied with Iran in keeping Assad in power in Syria. So they're a tacit ally. So that, again, the criticism was it's a facade, that it's, it, it's not real. The notion of snapback would not, in fact, be implementable because the U.S. might.